And you're all set when you want to start. Is everyone seeing this? See, I see two screens, one for the next slide, and one for the current slide. Try again. How's that? That's good. Got it. All right. Well, thank you, Gary, for putting this together. I'll echo everyone else and saying how much I enjoy this opportunity to catch up with everybody in the division. Um, just quickly um, point out that this is part of the invertebrate fisheries project investigations, and that's under the survey and assessment program. So just to give some background, um, the channel whelk fishery accounts for about 80 to 90% of all whelk landings in Massachusetts. The rest are mostly knobbed whelk, and then there's a few other landings that trickle in for some other species. The uh, trap fishery accounts for most of the landings, and about 90% of the trap fishery is channeled whelk landings. Um, most of these landings are coming from Nantucket Sound, uh, Buzzards Bay, and Vineyard Sound. There's also a mobile gear fishery that takes place mostly in Nantucket Sound. That's both otter trawl and the dredge fishery. Um, and both of those are bycatch fisheries where uh, there, something else is being targeted. And there's a minimal hand harvest um, take mostly knobbed whelk, and that's your divers or your um, breakers or other shell fishers. And there's a very minimal amount of recreational whelk fishing. So one of the most common questions or um, kind of usage of whelk and conch back and forth is interchangeable terms comes up. These in Massachusetts are all whelk species. So whelk are carnivores or scavengers that live in temperate waters. And conch are herbivores that live in tropical waters. So we don't have any conch in Massachusetts. And then uh, within Massachusetts, we have channeled and knobbed whelk, which are the two I'll talk a little mostly about today, a little bit about knobbed whelk, mostly channeled. And then more up in Mass Bay, uh, there's waved whelk, Stimson's whelk, and Tenridge whelk. So channeled and knobbed whelk, they're both predatory marine snails found in water less than 100 feet deep, mostly muddy and sandy sediment. And especially in like bays or sounds are more common than open ocean water. The females anchor egg cases into the sediment. So this is an egg case coming out of a channel dwell here. So this end would be anchored into the sediment and then it kind of strings up off the ocean bottom. And the juveniles hatch out of this after developing over the winter as miniature adults and settle straight to the bottom. So there's no larval dispersal for this, these two species. And there's limited migration potential for both of them. They don't go very far. So the ones in Massachusetts belong to us. We're not sharing with federal waters or uh, like Rhode Island as an example. So that makes them particularly subject to area depletion because there's not a lot of immigration coming in if they get removed from the area. They feed on live shellfish or scavenge on other dead fish, shellfish, crabs, and the Differentiate between the two species. The channel whelk have the perostracum on their shell, like the brown furry stuff, and knob whelk have these knobs up here. And on the underside, they have a more of an orange color. So within Massachusetts, we are at the northern extent of both of these species range, with Cape Cod being the geographic barrier. There are a few in Barnstable Harbor and Wellfleet Harbor that we've documented, but I'm not aware of any, any further north than that. The biggest population we see is within Nantucket Sound. 
over here. And um, kind of the beginning of this story started in 2009 when we were petitioned by a group of fishermen on Martha's Vineyard to go up on the minimum legal size. And uh, prior to doing that, it was posed with the question, is there any biological justification to do that? It turns out there wasn't a lot of available information in the literature. So that launched into a, a study that I turned into my master's thesis. And the primary objectives were to determine the size and age at maturity and the growth of channel dwelk in the three areas where the primary fishing takes place, Nantucket Sound, Vineyard Sound, Buzzards Bay. And then also I wanted to throw in New Bedford Harbor because we thought whelk existed there and it was close to fishing for at least 40 years. So we wanted to try to look at a unfished population. As well, we wanted to determine when the egg casings were being extruded. And to do that, we collected mature females on a monthly basis to examine the gonads and how the cycles changed. And then we wanted to compare the results to between areas to see if there were differences and compare those to the minimum legal size to see if we did, there was a, indeed a reason to go up on the size. So for sample collection, we use standard commercial whelp traps. We set them in strings of 10 single traps at each one of these starred locations. And we set them for one to three days, which basically is, it falls within the lines of commercial walking practices, but just to basically use the best weather day you could after you get them soaked for at least 24 hours. After hauling, we brought all the walk back to the lab for processing. And at first we brought everything back and then over time we would target the size range that we didn't have as many of. So if we didn't have as many big ones or the smallest size, we target those. So in 2010 through 2011, we collected a total of a little over 1300 whelk. And then in 2015, at the request of the Marine Fishery Advisory Commission, we did a second sample in Nantucket Sound where we collected almost 500 more. And of note in 2015 was that the size range had really truncated uh, from the initial study. So in the initial study, we saw more larger whelk in the population. And then in 2015, they had gotten a lot harder to come across. So sample totals are all right here. This is for uh, both the studies combined. So once we brought them back to the lab, we processed them all within two days. So we never froze these, it was always done alive. Took a series of external measurements. This um, standard length here is, was taken. And then um, standard width is what the fishery had used in the minimum legal size. And we felt that that was more appropriate because the tip of the siphonal canal is pretty brittle and often breaks off. And sometimes you can't tell if it's been grown back or not. So we felt the length wasn't as accurate a measure for uh, consistency purposes. Took weight to the nearest um, tenth of a gram. And I'd like to point out that this concept of kind of a measuring board slash caliper, I went to Ed Clark and talked about, and he was able to design these for us which has been really useful for us. These are much more accurate and we can use them a lot faster. So anytime you're more accurate and do it quicker, that's much better for us. So following the external measurements, we extracted the animal from the shell and that was the point where we could determine sex. So for whelk, it, you can do that by presence absence of a penis indicating male and then female has present absence of an edmental gland, which is the gland that's used to make the egg casing for female whelk. Took weights of both the gonad and the edmental gland if they were present, and then determined stage of maturity macroscopically. So 
looking at these going across the top, these are males. Start with an immature male. This is the gonad here, this slight orange translucent structure. And the vas deferent is this little white line right here. So as they mature, the gonad gets a third dimensional uh, component to it. So it raises up, it turns a pretty bright orange color and it's much larger. And that corresponds with the uh, vas deferens filling up with sperm. So if sperm was present, the males were mature. For females, the gonad starts out for immature ones. It's very similar to the male. It's that very light orange color. And then it becomes uh, a more detailed orange color over time as a ovary starts to show oocytes developing and the nidmental gland starts to get larger. So this one here would be a developing female, still not capable of reproducing. The next stage is when the gonad really swells up into the third dimension. It gets taller, if you will. And the egg cells of whelk are like column shaped. So they really have a height component to them, which is unique to any other species I'm familiar with. And then finally, when they're really ready to go, all the oocytes have uniform size. You can see the yolk present. They gonads gotten much larger and then mental glands much, much larger, capable of producing the elaborate egg casing. For age determination, this is the operculum, kind of the trap door when it goes into a shell, if you're not familiar with it. And we use the backside of it and counted the striae that were present. This was done twice um, by the same reader. And then if there were any uh, discrepancies that were examined a third time. And then we use this formula here, which uses a number of striae present and subtracts 0.5 because we know these hatch out around June or July in Massachusetts. And then this here adds on the month when sampling took place to eliminate any bias associated with um, sampling one in April as an example versus December. You want to try to give it proper aging so you don't treat both of those as the same age. And then we looked at seasonal samples to try to determine when the striae was being produced. And we saw the least amount of new growth from the terminal striae. So from here to the top, we saw the least amount of new growth in the spring and the most amount of growth in the fall. And then um, as things progressed, they started, to, it was determined that the statolith is a more reliable aging structure, which is a tiny sensory organ. And uh, Scott Elsey and his crew in the Age and Growth Lab are able to determine or extract those and age them. That wasn't done for this study, but going forward, any whelk aging will be going through those. So for growth, the females reach older estimated ages in all four areas we examined. And um, both females and males had similar growth in all regions until age six. And of note is that's when the males reach maturity is around age six. So it seems once the males become mature, their growth slows and the females continue to grow at a faster rate. So we saw this difference uh, in growth in all areas, and we think it's likely related to temperature, why there's differences between areas or even possible habitat differences. In terms of size at maturity, females mature at larger sizes than males in all areas. And this was a case, these are the exact um, W50 size at 50% maturity for each area. And what you can see down in these two graphs are the W50s plus or minus two standard errors. And where those standard errors don't overlap, it's known that there's significant differences. And the reason that the males from New Bedford Harbor have these large error bars is because we didn't find a lot of small males in New Bedford Harbor. So it went from having 
0% mature at one millimeter size bin to 100% at the next, and the model doesn't like that, so it gives a lot of error to it. And conclusion here was that there are differences in size and maturity, um, especially within females. And both within this study and other published studies, we found that there's an inverse correlation between water temperature and size of maturity, such that the animals that are in the coolest water, or the females, mature at the largest sizes. In terms of age, similar, we had uh, females maturing at older ages than males in all areas and there were differences between areas. And again, you can see those differences here. In this case, uh, Vineyard Sound has the oldest age and maturity for both males and females. For re seasonal reproduction, this only we only looked at females. Um, females can store sperm. So as a result, males can reproduce at any point. They don't have an exact season. The females, on the other hand, do seem to have a synchronous time when they put out their egg strings. And what we observed was by um, taking a GSI of both the nidbental gland and the ovary, that there was a peak in August indicating that spawning was occurring around August. We were very fortunate that while we were doing our study, uh, P. Moeller and Stevens overlapped with us in Buzzards Bay in the same exact year. And while as an independent study, they also used a different um, determination for maturity, they used histology. And um, it turns out that their results and our results were very similar within Buzzards Bay. So for males, it was about a one millimeter difference in estimate at size at 50% maturity. And for females, it was about 0.3 millimeters. So very close. And there were slight differences in the ages, not a whole lot, but we used different aging uh, methods because our study applied um, that correlation formula to try to account for uh, sampling time of year. So this suggests that macroscopic and histologic evaluations have similar results within Massachusetts. And both studies indicated that there were no female spawners protected by the minimum legal size. So that goes back to our original question. Um, was it warranted to go up on the minimum legal size? So when we were petitioned, the size was two and three quarter inches. And that turns out to have been based on a marketability standard that dealers had produced and it wasn't based on biology at all. So that was in place from 92 to about 2000, until 2012. But there was no standardized gauge defined and there was also a 5% tolerance for undersized wealth. So in 2012, um, environmental police conducted several um, checks on fishermen. They weren't enforcing rules there or anything at that point. They were just starting to look at whelk catch. And I believe they checked 12 boats and of the 12 whelk boats, only one of them had a gauge present at all. So that led us to realize that the first thing we had to do before we could even think about going up on the gauge was to create a standardized gauge. Because at the time, um, people were literally, some were using soup cans, some had holes in their gunnel, or like I mentioned, many vessels didn't have anything at all. So what we did was we took a piece of aluminum box tubing and cut it in half. And it was three inch outside diameter. So at the time that left us a two and three quarter inch inside diameter. And we did this with the help of fishermen because we were trying to make a design that would work quick because the traps come up with quite a few whelk in them. Um, they don't have escape vents. So there's quite a few sublegal or smaller whelk in traps that they have to process and measure. So this new gauge required that um, you pass the whelk through with 
a line drawn, if you will, from the tip of the apex to the tip of the siphonal canal had to be parallel to the sides of the gauge to give you a standard measure passing through the gauge. And that's with the opercular opening down and flat on the gauge. So this was an improvement, but it turns out there was a lot of variation between um, where one would draw this line. If some people wanted to raise it a little bit so the if the whelk wasn't quite flat on the gauge, it measures larger. We had some folks that were modifying the gauge to make the whelk measure larger. And you couldn't get consistent um, agreement between multiple users. So in 2017, we switched to a definition that defined the gauge and not the size of the animal. So starting then, we said with the opercular opening down, flat on the gauge, if you can pass the whelk through in any orientation, then it's considered sublegal, has to be released. Also put in place that everyone has to have a gauge present and you're not allowed to modify the gauge. And all whelk had to be measured immediately. They couldn't be held in totes and measured at the end of the day as an example. So it turns out that this was much more repeatable between users. And we also got together with law enforcement and made a YouTube video um, just to have as a reference for anyone to look at, including law enforcement, if they had someone that wanted to argue with them about proper gauging techniques. And then based on the results, um, this is a current projection we have on the books to get to the size at 50% female maturity in Nantucket Sound by 2029. Um, some other trap fishery regulations. So within the trap fishery, it's limited license. That's been the case since 1990. Each fisherman can have 200 traps. They're issued 240 trap tags per year. It has to be owner operator. So the owner of the permit has to be on the vessel when they're fishing. And in order to transfer the permit, they have to have 5,000 pounds of landings in four of the five previous years. So to, uh, to point out here, there's still room for some expansion in this fishery, even though it's limited license, because there's been over 50 uh, latent licenses in every year. And we've also seen people that used to fish less than the maximum number of traps or their trap limit go from fishing 50 or 100 traps up to 200 traps at a time. So we have seen some expansion, um, even though licenses are capped. Some of the other fisheries, so the bottom trawl that requires that the fishermen have a coastal access permit and it's limited to a thousand pounds of mixed whelk, so knobbed and channeled combined per trip or 24 hours, whichever is longer. And again, that's mostly bycatch in the summer flounder or fluke fishery. And that was created several years back um, because when fluke quotas were lower, we had fishermen that were getting their fluke quota and then continued to tow um, to get more whelk. And there was concern amongst other fishermen that they were discarding fluke in order to continue to catch whelk. Um, the dredge fishery does not have a trip limit, but they have existing dredge size limits. They can't have a dredge larger than 48 inches. For the hand harvest fishery, they're allowed one level filled fish tote per day of mixed whelk combined. And then the recreational fishery, um, when we came up with a newer gauge, we, did, we realized that you couldn't expect a recreational fisherman to come up with one of those gauges easily. So we switched to a 15 whelk knobbed and channel combined limit per day, but with no size limit. And they have to also check in with uh, town regulations like other shellfish species. Uh, kind of in the other category, like all shellfish, they, the whelk have to be tagged at sea with a permit number and name so they can be tracked. And Massachusetts does allow non-conforming whelk from other states to be processed in Massachusetts because um, 
traditionally that's been the case. Welk have come in from especially Rhode Island to be processed in New Bedford. And Massachusetts do, doesn't have any um, channeled or knobbed whelk out in federal waters adjacent to our waters. So in order to track fishery trends in the channel whelk fishery, we have several sources of data. We have the harvester data that comes in. That's been mandatory since 2000. We have the um, safest reports uh, from the dealers. We, have, we collect sea sampling data. We've done that aboard commercial whelk trap boats. Um, we use, again, this slide style uh, measuring board really helps us try to keep up. Um, we measure the complete contents of, a tr of as many traps as we can when their catch rates are really high, um, especially the wire traps that fill up with sublegals. We can't sample all the traps, but we do measure the complete contents of every trap we sample. And we uh, had to stop doing market sampling because we realized that they were pre-sorting the catch. So the, we really weren't getting a accurate estimate of uh, commercial catch size when the catch was pre-sorted and we couldn't put it back together, if you will. And then we have two sources of fisheries and independent data, uh, primarily the trawl survey. And then additionally, we have the ventless lobster trap survey in Buzzards Bay that we collect whelk data from. Uh, we focus mostly on Nantucket Sound and the ventless trap survey doesn't go there, but there's potential to use that within Buzzards Bay. So over time, um, the fishery really took off the blue line here is landings and they peaked in 2012. It was 3.6 million pounds of channeled well coming into Massachusetts, um, all caught in Massachusetts. And that was over, worth over $6.3 million, the green line being the value. And then the red line showing the price over time. And you can see that price has really gone up over time. And that's largely because there's been demand for whelk uh, worldwide, this is exported and mostly consumed in East Asia. And it, the channel dwarfs become more popular as other fisheries around the world have collapsed and not been able to fill the need. So this is looking at um, trap landings. So Nantucket Sound here in the red, you can see was really what was driving the peak. Whereas the blue, blue here from Vineyard Sound, green from Buzzards Bay, and then black from all the other areas combined has really kind of been stable over time. It was really that big bump in Nantucket Sound that happened. So that's landings. This is effort. This is trap hauls over time, showing that there's also been a, a big decrease in the amount of trap hauls in Nantucket Sound, especially in recent years while the other areas have stayed pretty stable. Now this, this is showing catch per unit effort. So catch is down, uh, efforts down, but catch per unit efforts also down. And you can see this first big drop here um, came when we implemented a standardized gauge. So this wasn't a size change. This was just having a gauge at all. And also, um, you know, we believe that the fishery had been overutilized and the stock had started to drop off at this point too. And this is showing the different gauge sizes over time. And this is when the shoot gauge was implemented. So this is our um, commercial catch data. This is going out on the whelk boats. And our earliest data was from 2003 and four. And this vertical line on both of the graphs is the size at 50% maturity for females. And of note is that in the early sampling, we saw a much more spread out um, size distribution and more larger individuals, especially um, at or above the size at 50% maturity. And then in our more recent data, um, we're just not seeing those large ones anymore. 
they're really starting to bunch up just below the minimum legal size, which is all indicative of um, a lot of fishing pressure. Is there a trawl survey trends? So I think there's a couple of things going on here. This is the spring survey. This one's the fall survey on the right. I think what might be happening here is we might be starting to see the effects of having larger gauge sizes, leaving some animals over um, that are susceptible to being caught in the trawl survey. It's hard to say for sure. The numbers <clears throat> aren't very big that we see in the survey, but um, it certainly looks like that could be a possibility based on the size data from the catch as well. And then um, for them not to be there in the fall, that either means they're being removed or um, probably more likely we're experiencing some warmer summer temp summer water temperatures, which um, whelk tend to not like and kind of bury in and not be susceptible to the gear at that point. So those are some possible reasons that we see the disparity there. So what we did once we collected all this information, uh, we turned to Gary Nelson, who did one of the first ever whelk stock assessments that I'm aware of. Um, he focused on Nantucket Sound, kind of took a shotgun approach, if you will, and tried a bunch of different models um, to develop some estimates of fishing mortality and stock biomass. And I'm not going to go too deep into the stock assessment, other than say that there is a DMF technical report that Gary co-authored, or Gary authored, and we co-authored with him. Um, if you really want to cook it down quickly, basically every model that he ran showed that overfishing was occurring and the stock was overfished. So conclusions from all this, um, there is variation in size, age, and growth between areas for whelk. Um, within Massachusetts, there's evidence the macroscopic and histologic gonad evaluations have very similar results. We've seen landings decline in recent years, though prices kind of stabilize the fisheries value. And then our stock assessment shows that um, both the whelk are both overfished and overfishing is occurring. And um, with the 2021 gauge size, minimum legal size is still protecting 0% mature females in Nantucket Sound and Vineyard Sound. Um, we are finally on the board in Buzzards Bay with about 15%. So that I'd be happy to take any questions in just a moment, but I do wanna thank pretty much I think it's close to half the division that's helped in some capacity with these various projects over time. Um, it's much appreciated, especially the folks back at the NRC days that would stay past their shifts. And I don't know if it was out of interest or pity, but um, helped me collect data when we were in the boiler room next to the garden tractor. So thank you.